dear iap functionaries uh, that uh, ramesh babu president that rajendran secretary that uh, gopal treasurer that uh, ismail president 2021 and that uh, suresh balan president 2023 my dear friend anamala vijay raghavan great teachers professor sinivasan um, professor prc dr janani the all list of professor nidinjalayan i would like to thank the iap functionaries for giving me this opportunity any opportunity in a session everybody learn together only that's what i also felt every opportunity given is a learning for not only for the participant also for the organizers faculty and everybody so community pediatrician what is his need what we are providing to them if you look at the op practice is a rough calculation i don't have a data if you look at it in the op practice including managing kids in small hospitals 80% is done by the community pediatricians we can call him as a community pediatrician or the practicing pediatrician but probably community pediatrician is the right terminology because he is practicing in the community plus some small hospitals mild case admission with that he is a general as well the soldier not only avar than tholilali avar than avar than single man clinic single man uh, health services so far in all, all cme specialist we were providing them what we know without asking their needs because we select the topic and give it to them like uti convulsions to the community pediatricians now i thought we will provide what they want so i request the community pediatricians to express your needs so that our topics will be decided by you which will be useful to you for practice our team under the guidance of iap includes me and the iap functionaries and uh, today's uh, चार पर्सन डॉक्टर आर सेलवन एंड द फैकल्टी डॉक्टर राजकुमार ए कंबरनाथ बालाजी एंड देन दाक्षायणी इन थर्ड जनवरी नाइनटीन सेवेंटी फाइव टी एन एम एस आई गाट द नंबर फ्रॉम टी एन एम एस सी फॉर प्राक्टिस रजिस्ट्रेशन नंबर टू फाइव एट टू सिक्स नियरली फिफ्टी फिफ्टी इयर्स इन दिस आलमोस्ट आई स्पेंड फिफ्टीन इयर्स इन द कम्यूनिटी नाइनटीन सेवेंटी फाइव टू नाइनटीन नाइन बिफोर ए क्लेम टू द i was a community pediatrician faced all problems related to the community pediatrician the community pediatrician has moved from landline phone pager mobile smartphones ipads laptops and whatsapp groups in his personal life but his community service is not seen so many steps i believe a group of community pediatricians under the guidance of iap and senior colleagues this venture is started it is not an another cme it is not a buffet it is like an a la carte menu you can order and get what you want that's a request to the community pediatricians these are all the topics professional topics we have planned in the forthcoming session this may the title may look little boring but we will make it interesting by the very nice faculty and the interesting faculty like iap prescriptions we don't have a standardized prescription for the op practice probably iap can come out with the format we can prepare a format how do we choose our drugs we means here the community pediatricians how to maintain the cards in one session probably we can cover iap als mass awareness program which will teach the intricacies of the pals iap helpline probably responds within 12 hours somebody can raise a doubt we can the team can answer within 12 hours with the concurrence and acceptability of the iap team work life ba balance stress management financial planning social and environmental disability human ethical values humor all this may not be covered at least we will select five or six topics so that this will cover so i request the community pediatrician respond to the topics you want we have chosen this topic but this being the first topic we didn't have time to select but we have selected tropical infection because commonest cause of a op visit to a community pediatrician is fever short term fever fever within 5 to 7 days common causes are benign viral infections constitute about 80 to 90% of benign viral infection child comes with fever on monday resolves everything by wednesday that is including viral exanthem they may not need anything more than just simple paracetamol bacterial infection which are clinical identifiable skin infection ura lra pneumonia uti it can be treated with simple investigations by the op pediatrician itself tropical infection dengue malaria lepto scrub and typhoid these five constitute a major share of op between particularly between june to february and they are the major reasons for hospital admission during this period also that's why we have chosen this topic i'll just start with a simple algorithm fever less than 7 days first step is to assess the abcs airway breathing circulation this may look little odd for a community pediatrician 
I am seeing 150 patients per day. How can I go through the ABC and make a decision based on the IAB PALS group? That is definitely possible. I'll just see you in the next slide. Then look at the host. The AB is abnormal. Child is in shock, respiratory distress, respiratory failure. Immediately, child may have to be hospitalized. The child has to be safely referred. This will happen maybe once in a day or once in a week, depending on your busy practice. Then look at the host, normal or high risk host. High risk host also may not be seen in the OP practice, but sometimes definitely a new age or a child and chemotherapy or just child dropped chemotherapy just now recovered from the serious malignancy. A child nephrotic syndrome and steroid, all days may not be very common in OP practice, but still they come. They also need uh, investigation and hospitalization. If there is a normal host, then we keep the child and look for the focus like a tonsillitis, skin and soft tissue infection, or UTA, or features of pneumonia, or arteritis media. And also look for clues or specific disease. A child with flushed palm and soles, dengue season, muscle pain, few rashes, all this will make us to think in terms of Kawasaki or dengue. Then finally, we take a decision based on the age. Less than 30 days or children with less one to three months, usually they are all high risk host. We have to take a decision to investigate them. This is a video. Um, my One of my friend is a pharmacist. He is coming to my clinic at the OP. This video, only one minute video, will tell us how a IAB PALS or PALS based assessment of the critical age child or ABC, how it can be made in a simple OP practice. For every child, we can assess the ABC. Child comes with the shirt removed. Child looks around, curious to know what is happening around, looks for eye contact. So child is alert. Now you have time to count the respiratory rate for 15 seconds. No noisy breathing, no strider V's or grunt, no retractions. Rate I counted comes to around 32. You can count for 15 or 30 seconds. Distract the child and check the dorsal speed is. Thanks to my friend for permitting to play this video of his video on this child. So it is possible to assess the ABC in the first one minute. The one minute ABCs are normal. This child may not require a very high level investigations or any hospitalization. So now you request Dr. Selvan, the chairperson, to take over the session from me. Uh, I'll have the happiness of introducing Dr. Selvan. All of us know about him. He's very enthusiastic, community pediatrician and hospital pediatrician. He's DCS DNB, MRCB CH from UK. Designation is a child health consultant working in Lotus Hospital E Road. His area of interest is office space research. He has 14 papers published. Uh, he's not attached to a big institution, but he has published 14 papers in National Kochi National Neocon, Evidence Based Neonatology Conference, and he has received awards. B.B. Sundar Kaur Research Fellowship of IAP Intensive Care Newborn and Children, a TR Award IAP TNSP for free paper at uh, Salem Pedicon, a Balagobal Rajus Active Pediatrician Award. More than all, the amount of interest he shows in community practice, in uh, patient education, you can see a lot of his videos and uh, talks to the parents. They're all very enthusiastic and very stimulating. I hand out the session to Dr. Selvan. Go to Dr. Selvan. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, giving me this, this opportunity to be with the IAP. And IAP is doing the best of services for the practicing pediatricians. And as the practicing pediatrician, every one of us face so many issues. We may not be having a specific uh, lab support or a big support in our disposal but we need to diagnose many of us will be practicing in a small place and as uh, sar has said uh, the basic history and a small fast and 
uh, as usual, very good clinical examination will help in getting the diagnosis of the children who have come to our clinic. So thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity, sir. And thanks a lot for your uh, nice words. And it is all because of the teachers like you and the previous, uh, our gurus, we were being able to just to follow a few practical things which you have taught us. Now I call upon Dr. Rajkumar from uh, Madurai Medical College and he'll be talking on uh, dengue and how a community pediatrician can diagnose and manage and refer at the correct moment. So over to Dr. Rajkumar, please. Yeah, Rajkumar, you can present your slides. Rajkumar, unmute. unmute. Uh, uh, I think uh, I'm sharing my screen, sir. Is it uh, visible, sir, now? It, it to be shared. Now, okay, now visible. Okay. So now it's full screen? So full, shall screen. I, shall I... full screen, audible. Okay, sir. sir. Good evening, one and all. So first of all, let me thank uh, our IAP President Ramesh Babu, sir, Secretary Rajendran, sir, Professor and Gopal Supramaniam, sir, past President Ismail, sir, and uh, 2023 President Suresh Balan, sir, VP Vijay Raghavan, sir, and other learned professors, my friends, and others. So good evening, one and all. Uh, the, actually, the brainchild of uh, today's program, uh, this, uh, you know, is uh, Dr. Tangaveli. This program is a brainchild. And Tangaveli sir has took a lot of pains to make this program a successful one. And he has fine-tuned uh, so many times. He called me and you know, over phone, he talked with all of our faculties. And uh, I, I'd, I'd like to thank our chairperson, Selvan sir also. He also took a lot of pains to make this program a successful one. So with that brief uh, you know, uh, introduction, I'll go to the my topic. So the topic today I'm going to talk is about Deng weakness for practicing pediatricians. So with the... I'm going to talk about the basic uh, uh, basic uh, physiology about the dengue and how to diagnose, how to manage dengue at the primary care level. I will not be talking about dengue management at ICU level, so please uh, don't get uh, uh, discouraged. And uh, I am Dr. Rajkumar, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Madurai Medical College. I'm also uh, this year EB member from Madurai. And uh, uh, I'm also Secret uh, Treasurer of uh, Tamil Nadu ID, ID chapter also. So this will be an informal session where we actually I collected uh, not only myself we all we all collected so many questions from practicing pediatricians. We have chosen only ten only to for our presentation today because of uh, want of time. So the first question actually this is in uh, every pediatrician mind when to suspect dengue fever in the periphery. So some people may say this is not common in our area. Some people will say only you should suspect dengue fever only after monsoon season. Some people will say whenever a child comes with fever for more than a week, then only you suspect dengue fever. But some people say that any time any child comes with fever, you have to suspect dengue fever. So what's the answer? The answer is D. So no, any time any child which comes with fever in our setup, you know, now nowadays dengue actually is firmly entrenched in our Indian subcontinent, especially in Tamil Nadu. We are seeing dengue cases every month. Even now, no, so we may get an avalanche of cases after post monsoon but every month uh, even during peak winter season even before rains and even during peak summer season we are seeing dengue cases so we have to suspect dengue fever with any child comes with fever for one or two days especially when the fever is very high 40 to 40 degrees centigrade and is accompanied by at least two of the following symptoms when the child has severe headache or retroorbital pain or muscle and joint pains nausea and vomiting and of course with rash we have to suspect dengue and one more thing, this is you now it's a bit uh, idea given by Dr. Uh, Professor Tangaveli, sir. What do you say? Sometimes, you know, by doing a child comes with fever for two days, like fever without focus, you do CBC and CRP, no need to do all costly tests to do diagnose things. CBC and CRP will give a clue. If CBC is showing leukocytosis and CRP is high, we know it is going to be a bacterial infection. And if CBC is showing leukopenia and CRP is high, we have to think that we may, maybe we are dealing with enteric fever. And when CBC is showing leukopenia on day two or day three, and the CRP is normal because you know ding, the plated count may fall by fourth day. So sometimes third day end or fourth day. So CBC shows leukopenia and the CRP is normal. We have to strongly suspect dengue and we have to uh, do appropriate investigations and appropriate measures. And this has to be, of course, confirmed by NS1 antigen test. 
So this brings out the second question. This is a common, a burning question asked by practicing pediatrician. How to confirm the dengue fever? Is it clinical diagnosis is enough? Or CBC alone is enough because this question asked by so many people. Or uh, we have to do NS1 dengue card test or IgM IgG dengue card test. So how how we are going to confirm? None of the above. The answer is because you know 2015 our government of India has given guidelines which says that the case of dengue should be diagnosed when the case is compatible with the clinical description of dengue fever with at least one of the following with either NS1 antigen test by ELISA or IgM antibody test by ELISA or IgG sera conversion in paired sera of fourfold increase or of course the you know, laboratory methods or detection of viral nucleic acid by PCR or culture and isolation. And I please, I, I beg you know, practicing pediatrician, please don't order this test, the rapid diagnostic kit for dengue because the problem is most of these kits, they do not have the, the you know, expected accuracy. They have show a high rate of false positive results. The, even the sensitive and the specificity of, uh, you know, uh, they vary from lot to lot. So use of this you know, rapid diagnostic test is not at all recommended. So what to do, well, how to confirm the diagnosis of dengue? You know, the NVB DCP, it recommends only two tests for confirmation of dengue in the community level. One is the use of ELISA-based NS1 antigen detection test, and this can be possible. This will be positive even from day one. And doing IgM dengue by capture ELISA, MAC ELISA test after fifth day of onset. Only these two tests have to be done. So we're coming on to the third burning problem when we're dealing with a fever uh, uh, case of dengue. That would be the fever management. So what sort of antipyretic measures we have to do bring to bring down the temperature apart from paracetamol because we know that dengue fever has a very high degree of fever in the first few, few days and the fever will not recommend, you know, respond sometime to paracetamol. So can we use brufen? Can we use mephenamic acid, aspirin, nimusulide, diclofenac, aciclofenac? The answer is None of the above. No, no, no. These, uh, no. We know that the first three days the fever would be very, very high. It will be above 40 degrees centigrade for at least two to three days. It will not come down even with paracetamol. But for that, if you use these NSAIDs, what happens? They inhibit COX-1 and COX-2, these enzymes. So they reduce the mucosal blood flow. They reduce the, the first line of defense of our gastric mucosa, the mucus and the bicarbonate layer. And they produce acid back diffusion. They impair the healing. They activate the leukocytes. And even sometimes, you know, they, uh, they produce platelet aggregation problem also. So ultimately, on the fourth day, fifth day, when the child goes into the critical phase with the thrombocytopenia and with the DAVC, when there is when there is a mucosal injury already with by this NSAIDs, this is a potent you know it's a deadly combination. This results in massive bleeding and child may die because we used unnecessarily this NSAIDs. So what are the measures we have to do to bring down the temperature of uh, dengue fever? We have to use cold depth sponging, of course, and avoid all these NSAIDs and paracetamol alone at a dose of 10 to 15 milligram per kg body weight per dose six hourly. This is more than enough. And, you know, and one more question you know, about paracetamol. Some people asked when a child has dengue hepatitis, what to do? Can we use paracetamol? You know, we, we must understand one thing. We always remember that paracetamol causes hepatotoxicity. You know, the problem is it in, in a short period when a child takes a lot of paracetamol, that is paracetamol poisoning because of the altered metabolism and glutathione stores are depleted, that results in the accumulation of this hepatotoxic intermediate, NAPQ, and that causes destruction of the hepatocytes. What, uh, what is seen is even in chronic liver disease patients, those who are having problem, liver problem, and if they are taking normal recommended doses of paracetamol, nothing happens. The cytochrome P450 activity is not at all increased and glutathione stores are not depleted. So this intermediate doesn't accumulate and doesn't cause any injury. So there is no evidence of increased hepatotoxicity with use of paracetamol in dengue hepatitis or even a child who is having hepatitis and we can use paracetamol safely. So this is the fourth burning question asked by practicing pediatricians. If we diagnose a dengue case, we have to immediately refer the child to ad for admission to a tertiary or secondary or tertiary center. So some people may think that, uh, yes, all must be referred immediately on diagnosis. And some people may think, no, I'll refer the case only when it becomes sick after day five. And 
you know this is the answer the answer would be they see very few cases they need referral to a, a secondary or a research centers and based on warning signs even before day five so what are the risk factors for the development of dengue shock? Now, if these risk factors are there, the pri uh, primary pediatrician, they should refer the case immediately to a secondary or a tertiary care center for admission, and this child should be managed uh, accordingly. Be uh, whenever uh, we, have, we see a child, of, uh, we see an infant with dengue or with comorbidities like diabetes mellitus, asthma, and obesity surprisingly actually malnutrition actually it gives a protection against dengue it seems obesity only results in uh, severe dengue and female sex you know whenever they have comorbidities and female sex better to refer to earlier even without development of these warning signs and in epidemiological uh, you know uh, uh, pro profile if there is a dengue 2 virus infection following dengue 1 Actually, what they say, the incidence of dengue hemorrhagic fever is very high, almost three to four times than that of a normal uh, epidemic. So in this period, we have to refer, if, even if you have doubt, we have to refer the child for admission. So these are the warning signs, the doctors we should look for whenever we observe a child and we, should, we, we see in OPD basis. Whenever a child develops severe abdominal pain, they should be explained to the parents also. Uh, they should immediately bring the child for immediately for the doctor's consultation when the child develops all these things. Severe abdominal pain, when there is persistent vomiting, when there is liver enlargement, when the breathing is very rapid and fatigue, restlessness, and bleeding, diet is like bleeding gums, nose, blood in vomit, stool, and child develops convulsions and altered sensorium, could be febrile convulsion or it could be dengue uh, encephalitis. It's a serious condition with a lot of mortality and jaundice and labor, of course, laboratory finding showing uh, hematocrit increasing and a decrease in platelet count. Okay, the fifth question, uh, practicing pediatrician, what they want to know is, can a dengue case be followed up in OPD without admission? Uh, you know, some, some people may be a very cautious approach. No, never. OPD you cannot follow up the case. And some people may say optimistically, yes, always you can do, no problem. Some people may say sometimes, some people may say most of the times. The answer is most of the times. Almost, you know, 70 to 80% of dengue fever cases can be treated on OPD basis because, you know, almost 40 crore dengue infections are happening all over the world every year. And this vast majority of symptomatic infections do not progress to severe disease. The progression, the percentage of uh, infections which progress to severe disease is only very less. And there was one beautiful study done in Thailand. Actually, Thailand, you know, being a tropical country, they are also having this dengue problem. And they have done so many studies. You know, if you search in internet, you will be seeing a lot of Thailand's uh, based studies. And one study they, they have done, uh, you know, a study in children aged three to fourteen years. And what they found out. The incidence of dengue hemorrhagic fever is only about 11% of de confirmed dengue fever cases. Only one tenth of a child may require referral to a higher center. And dengue shock syndrome occurs in only in one third of this 11%. That is, th ultimately, only 3% are going to develop this dengue shock syndrome, and 10% might uh, may develop dengue hemorrhagic fever. So, uh, and we we have to give some leeway for another 5 to 10% for. You know, they may be having some comorbidities. They may need admission for observation. So the rest 80% can be treated on OPD basis. This is the message I want to convey to the practicing pediatrician. So how to do this, uh, you know, OPD basis, uh, how to manage these people? Actually, there is a pediatric dengue severity scoring system I borrowed from Dr. Tangavili, sir, actually. Uh, if, if this is based on 11 parameters. And all, the, all these parameters we already know. We talked about all this, you know, the warning signs and output, um, you know, bleeding bleed, uh, about altered sensorium, the fluid requirement, and about CBC and warning presence of uh, uh, any comorbidities. So when the score is seven or more, definitely we have to, you have to refer the child for admission because the child needs observation, even when the child doesn't have severe symptoms. But a score of six or less, definitely this case can be followed up in OPD. So how to do this OPD follow-up? There are certain prerequisites for doing this OPD follow-up. One is, of course, they should not have any warning signs okay the next one the child should be able to take oral feeds at least three solid feeds and child should be able to drink six to eight liquid feeds and child should void urine at least five times per day and child even though it lies in bed but actively moving about in the house and interact with the siblings and parents and the last but not least you know this is the most important the parents should be cooperative and willing why cooperative and willing because 
twice daily they must bring the child to us for you uh, know for in the opd follow up and in the opd follow up our job is to look for the presence and absence of warning signs and you have to take a thorough history about hydrogen status how much fluid the child has taken how much urine output has taken taken there is a chart i i borrowed again from dr dangavel sir in the next slide i'll show and uh, vitals we have to measure and in the system examination look for the fluid accumulation signs pleural effusion ascites and the cbc of course you look at the hematocrit and the platelet trend so this is a simple format for opd follow up a simple one page is more than That's enough for the interruption yes sir sir we need two more minutes sir we have two more okay. minutes more okay, sir, sir. So Thank this you. is a simple Thank format you. where we, you know, for uh, three days we, we have to follow up with the warning signs and uh, uh, with the other lab lab parameters as well as the uh, signs, uh, dengue signs and symptoms. So interpreting CBC, this is a most important component. You know, the CBC would be the most important investigation in uh, following up a case of dengue. So why, which is the most important one? Which one you will see? Because our postgraduates or even primary pediatrician, they are more worried about platelets. Actually. all of the above you have to look at the wbc count hematocrit and platelets why because the wbc count goes down hematocrit increases and platelet comes down they all three they move and we know that leukopenia and altered nlr ratio they give a clue about the severity of dengue and thrombocytopenia and the hemo concentration we know the child goes for dengue shock syndrome so a serial value determination showing the drop in platelet and rise in hematocrit is essential and there is a, some you know looking at the wbc count we can make some prognostic significance uh, it takes usually 24 hours before the rise in platelet count the in 82% of individuals the wbc count increases but and uh, one more thing the presence of lymphocytes in cbc at the time of admission it predicts the length of hospital stay if there is lymphopenia that shows the child may develop uh, dhf or dss later so this will be particularly useful in remote areas with limited laboratory facilities the one more you know latest cbc if you order for cbc order for five part cbc because there is some prognostic significance of immature platelet count this gives a clue indicating your platelet recovery within 24 to 48 hours this is nothing but like our reticulocyte count for uh, doing for anemia and this normal values are 1.1 to 6 whenever you have Uh, ip ipf the immature platelet fraction is more than 10% you know that platelet is going to recover within 24 to 48 hours this will be useful in private in periphery setup when you have when you have a platelet count of 20 to 30000 you are worried platelet count may fall down further when you look at the ipf if it is more than 10 don't worry the platelet is going to rise from now onwards so i put one example for that within 6 hours the immature platelet fraction showing 31% the platelet count is started increasing this is the another dilemma a child admitted for just melina and child is everything is fine but parents want platelet or blood transfusion will you agree no refuse and why because this child can be managed conservatively with the simple measures and the watchful waiting you know in olden times we used to send tend to chase platelets we were given multiple transfusions at uh, platelet um, various platelet threshold this is re it was reinforced by patients and uh, family members and this resulted in exorbitant cost to the uh, admission and a danger to the child's life why it is danger to the child's life because we know dengue causes damage to the endothelium that results in release of large ultra large von willebrand factor and adam ts3 this is a enzyme which actually you know this disposes of this large uh, von willebrand factor and in dengue which results in deficiency of adam ts13 and the release of large von willebrand factor so if you give platelets you are going to further worsen the injury by producing more for platelet plug and microangiopathy so this will cause more harm than good there are only few indications for platelet or blood transfusion when the platelet count is less than 10000 or there is the external hidden hemorrhage sir sorry uh, for the interruption sir uh, okay. we are uh, exceeding our time limit sir so we we'll we'll take more slides, the, yeah yeah please sir okay. please sir please sir. Okay. yeah okay, okay. So. the fever returning after day 7 of illness sometimes you know when the child of dengue everything is fine the child was improving on day 8 if the child the, you know developed a fever on day 8 what could be the possibility is it sepsis or co infection or hemophagocytic lymphocytosis the answer is all look for sepsis you know sepsis commonly you know, sometimes accompanies uh, dengue infection and co infection with the enteric fever and malaria also they are nowadays common so look for those infections and hlh please don't forget secondary hlh can occur after day 7 day 8 with when, when there is persistent fever with the cytopenias and the last one is the prophylactic use of colloids will it prevent the occurrence of dss is a question asked 
preemptive use of colloids have no role. It, this didn't provide any benefit over crystallites, has no benefit prophylactic role. The colloids use are only during the critical phase in the management of shock after two crystallite boluses or when the management of shock is uh, on child is having leaking fluid or and a crystallite is just leaking out of the vascular space whenever it is being given. And please remember that these colloids can cause a lot of problem, especially with the coagulation problem and allergic reactions. So these are the take home points. You suspect D fever in any child with high fever in the peripheral setup and confirm it by doing NSO antigen by ELISA and use paracetamol as the sole antipyretic. Almost 78% of D fever can be treated on OPD basis. What we have to do is identify the warning signs early and refer them as soon as possible. And the CBC gives a lot more information than looking at the platelet count. And don't go for prophylactic fluids or blood and blood transfusion. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity given, by, given for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I have not introduced you at the first slide because it was uh, just, I just missed the slide. The sir is okay. from uh, Madhuri Medical College. He's an associate professor and he is uh, very much interested in teaching. He has got a very good uh, presentation for uh, which is uh, fit to be for the PGs. And usually it is going to be uh, taken probably in the, some other uh, session on dengue. So Thank you, sir. The Thank one you, point sir. which we are trying to make is uh, uh, we need to do the test only after three days because yes. ordinary viral fevers will settle down in three days. That Definitely, sir. Yes, sir. That's why uh, the answers in the chat box which will be taken up in the question and yes, answer sir. session. Question Thank answer. Thank you very yes, much, sir. sir. Thanks Thank for you, sir. your uh, absolute uh, nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the compliments. Yeah. I'll call up the next speaker. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Darshani. Yeah. Yeah, you can uh, share your slide, please. Um, yes, sir. Sir, Dr. Rajkumar, sir. Yeah, shall I do it? One yes, sir. Okay. One minute, one minute, one minute, sorry. So I've seen some problem with their computer seems, sir. So I'll share the screen now. Yeah, please proceed now. Proceed. I'll, I'll share the screen. Yes. You can go, ma'am. I'll, I'll just I'll move the slides. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, very good morning. Good evening to everyone. Um, at the outset, I thank the office bearers of uh, IAP KNC for this valuable opportunity and my teacher and mentor, um, Dr. Tanguvel, sir, for choosing me for this topic. So uh, this uh, talk would be on enteric fever. So this is the most common case scenario that we encounter. A six-year-old girl child is brought to the OPD with history of fever of five days duration, vomiting and right-sided abdominal pain and poor appetite. She has been treated at home with oral paracetamol. Dakshayani, Dakshayani, just, just hold on for a few seconds. I'll just introduce Dr. Dakshayani. Probably Selvan doesn't have the CV with him, I think. She's a very up, upcoming bright star in IAP. Whatever the responsibility is given, she has the habit of doing it in a perfect manner. Nobody else can do that in a perfect manner. Currently, she's a, a, a professor of pediatrics from government, Nahapanda Medical College. She has been the editor of a TNSC bulletin from 2017, 15 now to 2020. Probably a tenure may be also extended further also. He's a secretary so, of IAPCC by Adolescent Health Academy, EB member of Indian General of Practical Pediatrics, associate editor of Practical Pediatric Digest, associate editor of Illustrated Textbook of Undergraduates, Associate Editor of PICU Protocols IJPP Series, a recipient of the VBR Active Pediatrician Award, Young Faculty Award at the National Assembly of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, Hyderabad, areas of interest are pediatric diabetes and infectious diseases. Sorry for interrupting, Dr. Shani. You can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you very much, sir, for taking my responsibility. I could not see the slide. That's why I could not uh, introduce Dr. Dr. Shani. 
Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I'll proceed, sir. Uh, ah, you can proceed. Girl child yeah, please, sir, please, the... please. Yes, sir. A six-year-old girl child is brought to the OPD with a shift uh, fever of five days duration, vomiting, right-sided abdominal pain, and poor appetite. She had been treated at home with oral paracetamol. The child's fever spike had been on an increasing trend. According to the mother's documentation, on examination, the child appears toxic and has a hepatomegaly. So what is the most probable diagnosis that we make now? And of course, the diagnosis uh, we commonly make is enteric fever. That is because enteric fever is the most common cause of fever without focus. Around 27 million people annually are infected with uh, in enteric fever. And uh, more than half of it happens in children. And that too, very commonly in children less than five years of age. So uh, we'll proceed with the frequently asked questions when it comes to enteric fever. So what does enteric fever mean? Does that equate with typhoid fever? Yes, and not alone. It includes typhoid fever, which is caused by salmonella typhi, which accounts for 80%, and paratyphoid fever, which is caused by salmonella paratyphi A or B, which accounts for 20% of all cases. Uh, it is an acute generalized infection of the end reticular endothelial system. And as the name enteric fever signifies, it has predilection for the intestinal lymphoid tissue and gallbladder, and that is why the enteric symptoms. So how is the diagnosis of enteric fever commonly made in office practice? The most common cause of fever without focus is obviously enteric fever. So all of us initially make the diagnosis of enteric fever only clinically. In infants and young children, they present with fever, vomiting, diarrhea, Whereas older children present with progressive increase in temperature, which is the typical step ladder pattern, this uh, progresses over five to seven days. Children may also present with have a coated tongue, toxic appearance, uh, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, cough, and lethargy. On clinical examination, they might have a hepatomegaly, a soft splenomegaly, a tender abdomen, and relative bradycardia. The typical rash that is described in enteric fever, the, the rose spots, which are papular or maculopapular, appearing in crops. Uh, during the second week of illness, present over the chest and abdomen, which has been uh, described in text and literature, is very, very rarely seen in Indian children. So how will you make a definitive diagnosis of enteric fever? Having made a, have a clinical suspicion of enteric fever, we proceed with the lab diagnosis. A total count, which may be normal or low, with a neutrophilia and eosinophilia, may suggest uh, enteric fever with a clinical background. The presence of thrombocytopenia in enteric fever signifies severe disease or the presence of DAVC. The CRP will be elevated and LFT may show a mild elevation of transaminases. Having said that, the blood culture and sensitivity is the gold standard in investigation for the diagnosis of enteric fever. This will have a 90% yield in the first week of illness and up to 40% yield in the fourth week of illness. Bone marrow culture is routinely done in all cases of prolonged fever and in pyrexias of unknown origin. So prolonged enteric fever children will also uh, undergo a bone marrow culture. This is important because this remains positive even after antibiotic therapy. The stool and urine cultures are not recommended due to poor yield. Next slide, sir. So what is the ideal time to do a blood culture for salmonella? Blood culture for salmonella should be done ideally during the first week of suspected illness, preferably before initiating an antibiotic. Salmonella is a very easy organism to culture and antimicrobial sensitivity tests are important before initiating treatment. Paired cultures are to be sent. The ideal volume of blood would be 5 to 10 ml with a blood is to broth ratio of 1 is to 5. Automated blood culture systems like Bactic are available and this has improved the recovery of the organism and are also cost effective. Next slide. So what are the other investigations available to diagnose enteric fever? The time-tested and beaten to pulp vital test is the most commonly employed test for the diagnosis of enteric fever. This detects the presence of immunoglobulin M and IgG antibodies against the flagellar antigen H and uh, somatic antigen O of S type e and paratype A and B in the second week of illness. So if this comes as positive, this could be typhoid fever or paratyphoid fever. Uh, if we are to choose to uh, do viral test, tube method is better than the slide method. Antibody titer of more than uh, 1 is to um, 1 is to 160 dilution for both O and H is considered as positive. 
A fourfold rise in type one in paired samples, which is done one week apart, is the conventional method. However, it is less practical. So, what are the other investigations available to diagnose enteric fever? Uh, the typhoidot test, uh, the, which is the enzyme immunoassay test, detects IgM and IgG antibodies against the outer membrane protein for Salmonella type two. So, this is specific for type two. Though the specificity is thirty-seven percent, if this is positive, it would uh, turn out to be typhoid fever rather than paratypoid fever. Anaphylactic reactions are seen with other infections also. That is the issue with this uh, typhoidot test. The newer tests like nested PCR has specific. Um, um, H1D primers directed against S type. This helps in rapid diagnosis and could be promising in the future. Next slide, sir. What are the limitations of the serological test? Wider test is the most commonly employed test, but they are not diagnostic, may be supportive, and should not be relied upon alone for patient management decisions. It has very low sensitivity and specificity. False positive viral is seen in malaria, rickets cell infection, or infection with other enterobacteria. False negative viral is also seen in patients who have been treated with prior antibiotics. Though this test is obsolete, uh, being it, it is being done routinely because this is the most easily available test. Clinicians, but they should differ from diagnosing and treating enteric fever based on this viral test alone. Next, sir. what are the treatment modalities available for enteric fever? The mainstay of treatment of typhoid is specific antibiotic therapy. Children with persistent vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal distension, toxemia, and complications should alone be treated as inpatients. Otherwise, children with enteric fever may comfortably be treated on a domiciliary basis. Having stressed on the importance of specific antibiotic therapy, the importance of meticulous general supportive measures like maintenance of Proper hydration, good nutrition, antipyretics, and other symptomatic uh, treatment cannot be over overemphasized. Contrary to popular belief, there is no need to restrict any type of diet in cases of typhoid. Next slide, sir. So, what is the choice of empirical therapy for typhoid fever? Children with severe illness, complications, and children who are being treated as inpatients, the first choice would be injection ceftriaxone, which is given at a dose of 100 mg per kg per day. In two divided doses up to a maximum of four grams per kg. This can be switched over to oral cefixin as soon as possible. The mean time for deprivations of typhoid fever when the child is on treatment with ceftriaxone would be six to eight days. Uh, the issue of ceftriaxone resistance is not a major issue in Indian subcontinent. So MIC of less than one for ceftriaxone is associated with excellent clinical outcome. The second uh, choice. Um, parenteral drug would be injection cefotaxin, which is given at a dose of 150 to 200 mg per kg per day, up to a maximum of 12 grams per day. This issue is that it has to be given in three divided doses. But when children uh, started on ceftriaxone, develop features of biliary sludging and they are symptomatic and they develop concomitant hepatitis, injection cefotaxin is preferred. Next slide. So, astrionum is another parenteral drug. It can be used at a dose of 50 to 100 mg per kg in three divided doses. This can be given only IV or IM. This is the second choice drug, but this can be used only in multi drug resistant typhoid cases who are allergic to cephalosporins and in complicated uh, typhoid who do not respond to parenteral third generation cephalosporins. Next slide. So what is the drug of choice for outpatient treatment of typhoid fever? The first choice would be tablet uh, cefixin, which is given at a dose of 20 mg per kg per day in two divided doses up to a maximum of 1.2 grams. This is available as 20 mg and 400 mg tablets. And syrups are available in formulations of 5 ml containing 100 mg and 200 mg. The dose should be for two weeks, similar in it, uh, but th this is uh, oral, but still similar in efficacy to ceftriaxone and superior to phenylones. The second choice oral drug would be tablet azithromycin, which is given at a dose of 10 to 20 mg per kg per day, once a day up to a maximum of 1 gram per day in uncomplicated typhoid and quinolone resistant strains. This is given orally once a day. So uh, misuse of this drug is very rampant, but this should not be used routinely as it is a reserve drug for extremely drug resistant enteric fever and also in relapses. This causes prolonged QT interval. So, Cautious use of this drug, azithromycin, with drugs which can also uh, prolong the QT interval uh, should be emphasized. Next slide. 
So when do we expect response to treatment in enteric fever? The usual duration for defervescence in enteric fever is five to six days in optimally treated cases. Most children, they become afebrile within seven days of treatment, but therapy should be continued for at least 14 days in uncomplicated cases or for seven days after defervescence. But uh, this defervescence is a subjective phenomenon. It depends on the caregiver also. So it is imperative on our part to emphasize on the need for um, treating children with enteric fever for a complete 14 days. Next slide. What is the recommended duration of treatment? So to emphasize again, the duration of treatment is at least for seven days after defervescence or a total of 14 days, whichever is later. Azithromycin, on the other hand, is used for a total of seven days. Next slide. So how do you clinically make of defervescence in enteric fever? So Clinically, there is subsidence of fever, there is decrease in temperature spikes, return of appetite, and a perceived sense of well-being by the child and by the caretaker. The time taken for defervescence, as stated earlier, would be around five to six days in optimally and appropriately treated cases. Next slide. What is meant by delayed defervescence? Some children, despite using the appropriate drug in appropriate doses, would continue to have fever even at the end of one week. Uh, but they are otherwise well. In such cases, there is decreased uh, toxic features and reduced fever spikes and intensity of fever. Uh, and there is also quick response to antipyretics. But just that the child has persistent fever beyond seven days. So this does not warrant change or addition of the antibiotic. Treat a continued treatment with the same antibiotic that was initiated. Just give counseling and reassurance to the patient. So what is meant by clinical failure? This is seen in around 5 to 10 percent of cases. In spite of uh, using in vitro susceptible drug in appropriate doses, the child continues to have fever with toxic features beyond one week. In such cases, switch over to alternate sensitive drugs like azithromycin or quinolones. Do not use antibiotic combinations at any, uh, at any time. Consider other causes of fever like drug fever, thromboflebitis, co-infections ma like malaria, hepatitis C, and complications like infection-associated HLH. If you have tentatively, empirically diagnosed a child as enteric fever and start a treatment, this is the time to redo your diagnosis if you have not done the cultures previously. Review your diagnosis now with careful history, physical examination, and complete investigations if necessary because this child could have not been in a case of enteric fever in the first place at all. Next slide. So what is Rila? Please make it fast. We are, we are, we are uh, running out of time. Weeks after initial reservation uh, is called relapse. This is usually milder. Relapse rate uh, commonly seen in enteric fever despite appropriate treatment is 5 to 20%. Culture should be obtained and standard treatment should be administered. These cases, they respond well and quickly to the same drug as used for primary therapy, but in appropriate doses and right duration. Quinolones, if not used earlier, and azithromycin or uh, alternatives, relapse can be differentiated by reinfection only by molecular typing. Next slide. What is the present recommendation on the use of quinolones? This is obsolete now. Uh, this can be uh, cannot be used in children less than 8 years of age. Uh, but this had a short time for defervescence, which was four, uh, four days. Uh, if it needs to be used, it should be used at a dose of 15 to 20 mg per kg per day. Uh, this is not being used concurrently because of the uh, emerging resistance. This is reserved only for selected cases, especially relapses and therapeutic failures after doing an analytic acid sensitivity report. Because if you have an analytic acid sensitivity re uh, report as resistant, then we are not supposed to treat the child with ciprofloxacin. Next slide, please. So what are the commonly misplaced and misused drugs in entry fever? As stated earlier, quinolone have been used left and Dr. right. Dr. Dachayani, we are running out of time. Please make two it fast. Slides, sir. Just Thank two you. more slides, sir. Yeah, please. Azithromycin is a reserve drug and should not be misused. Aminoglycosides like amicacin have no role in management. As its uh, site of action is extracellular while salmonella is an intracellular organism. Next slide. The vaccines available for typhoid. Typhoid polysaccharide vaccine uh, is recommended in children more than two years of age. Typhoid conjugate vaccines are preferred. The Typhi BEV vaccine, is a, uh, this vaccine has been approved by DCGA in February 2020. Uh, Typhi bar TCV, uh, the typhoid conjugate vaccine have been in use for a long time now. 
the doses are only 0.5 ml so the triphoid conjugate vaccine so next slide sir so a recommended schedule a uh, triphoid conjugate vaccine would be 0.5 ml given im between 6 months to 9 months of age uh, if you are uh, planning to give a measles containing vaccine both should be separated by at least 4 weeks this is recommended up to 45 years of age boosters are not recommended for typhoid conjugate vaccines as of now polysaccharide vaccine is given at a dose of 0.5 ml it is recommended in children more than 2 years of age and a booster dose is required every 3 uh, years in children who have recovered from enteric fever this vaccine should be given 4 weeks after recovery if the child has not received the vaccine in the preceding 3 years next slide sir so blood culture is the gold standard in the diagnosis of enteric fever viral has many pitfalls do not make a diagnosis of enteric fever based on viral alone complete the recommended treatment for the recommended duration there is no role for dual drug therapy in enteric fever culture positive report prevents unnecessary use of azithromycin which must be kept as a reserve drug vaccination against typhoid decreases the severity of the illness and its complications thank you so thank you very much dr dakshayani for an elaborate and effective presentation on typhoid now i request the next speaker dr a kamrana to talk uh, on malaria we thought malaria is not now in tamil nadu but he has come with a diagnosis that malaria is very endemic even in chennai and he is going to show which are the areas in tamil nadu which are endemic for malaria so over to dr a kamranath he is he has completed his uh, mbbs from tanjavur uh, medical college uh-huh. md pediatrics from stanley medical college he has done his uh, fellowship in pediatric intensive care and he has been in the field of uh, pacu for the last 12 years he has published <laughs> articles in journals iap als instructor and he has spoken in many national conferences over to dr a kamarnath so good evening sir can you see my slides sir yes yeah you can go for slides sir more no that uh, complete uh, Ah, yes, sir. I hope you can see my slide, sir. Yes, visible and audible, both visible and audible. Yeah, okay. Proceed. Okay. So, good evening to everyone. So, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Thangavel sir, the convener and the moderator Selvan sir for giving me this opportunity, and also the IAPTN. Go for the TNS. slide show, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Sure. Okay. So, so my topic is malaria. So, I will start my presentation. so this is a scenario this is a 6 year old boy which i discharged only today he is admitted with is of two days fever and uh, while coming to my like uh, op he, he had febrile seizures and he was admitted immediately uh, only was 10 days ago he was discharged uh, being admitted for sorry with, for interrupting can you make it as a slide show so the screen is visible uh, i i have made it sir okay thank you thank you yeah it's okay, okay. you can proceed yeah, yeah. So he was recently discharged for a severe dengue 10 days ago only so um okay on on examination he didn't had any focus on general examination on even system examination he didn't had any abnormality so oh, since he was uh, having frequent fever i ordered investigation even on the uh, second day uh, which showed uh, uh, plasmodium vivax in a um, qbc also in the immunochromatography which was done so i ordered for smear which also showed uh, vivax on the peripheral smear study okay so this shows importance of the tropical infections and uh, I, this topic is very relevant for uh, right now so malaria is it still here so definitely it's very much here and uh, even though the incidence has come down compared to the earlier years it is still there and um, according to the dph in a recent uh, interview he said that uh, malaria is uh, like uh, present in uh, mostly in the coastal regions the districts i have mentioned here like chennai kanyakumari rameshwaram like that and the major breeding sites uh, what is been found is uh, the over at tanks so one of the, the vec- main vector and the, the urban vector stephen c or the culicephages everything um, 
the breeds in the clear water so the over tanks are found to be the main um, uh, breeding sites and then the fluoride is found to be influenced by um many times like uh, as has been already told by the previous speakers any fever so can you hear sir yega barnath you can uh, switch off your video uh, with your uh, quality of uh, voice yeah. the audio will be good okay sir yeah please proceed oh. um usually um, as mentioned many textbooks uh, the um, intermittent fever will be there in malaria but it may not be there in all the times um the vivax you have a fever alternate day but falciparum will have a daily fever but it may not be present in the earlier stages and it may be, it may not be present in all patients with fever so any patient with fever in the earlier stage with the non specific symptoms like cough headache vomiting diarrhea you have to suspect malaria and uh, the supportive findings which may give a clue may be like uh, splenomegaly on investigation thrombocytopenia or anemia may be there which will uh, give a clue towards uh, malaria and the lethargy and poor feeding indicates severe malaria so any of uh, any patients with these findings if you have a doubt go ahead and uh, do a lab test and confirm the malaria so what are the futures like uh, you have to consider if it is severe malaria so these are the conditions like oh, has been categorized as severe malaria the 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 four one the, the top four are the most common in our uh, region so first is cerebral malaria as we have seen commonly so when do you suspect cerebral malaria any patient who is uh, unconscious or uh, like uh, having altered sensory you have to suspect cerebral malaria with recurrent seizures like that the next common complication or severe type will be anemia complication and uh, other complication like uh, commonly we may come across is acidosis which may present as respiratory distress the other complications mentioned here are rare so they can be renal progenic type of pulmonary edema so one more thing is shock which is due to secondary bacterial infection which is called as classified as algid malaria or bleeding hemoglobinuria are not very common and uh, these are other manifestations like even if the patient is not having severe coma impaired consciousness or prostration and if you can get a parasite density if it is more than 5% watch the child you can have develop complications and high grade fever or jaundice these are the other things you need to classify under severe malaria so what to look for to look for the complications so we can go by the abcd technique so narrow breathing look whether the child has tachypnea or increased retractions uh, which suggests metabolic acidosis or pulmonary edema and then the circulation look whether the child has shock on disability you look for aloc which suggests cerebral malaria and exposure look for pallor and jaundice all these if the findings are there then you are, you are you might be seeing a patient with severe malaria you have to be cautious so what are the tests you can order to rule out cerebral malaria i mean severe malaria so in uh, cbc you look for anemia and thrombocytopenia the total counts are usually maybe normal or low uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia will suggest severe malaria and uh, check the glucose frequency to rule out hypoglycemia do an abg to rule out metabolic acidosis uh, look for bilirubin and elevated liver enzymes and rft to rule out any aki and coagulation parameters so how are you going to diagnose malaria so the gold standard as we have been uh, taught for long days will be the peripheral smear study uh, which is very useful and uh, the, the advantages will be like you can see the density of parasitemia here so the density of parasitemia can be seen by a peripheral smear study also the response to treatment can be assessed like how much the parasite density is coming down it can be assessed by looking at the smear but the drawbacks will be like uh, you need expertise and nowadays so finding the post getting a positive smear has been very difficult nowadays and uh, you need a proper equipment set up everything is needed um so based on the smear if you want to exclude malaria at least you have to do three negative thick blood films taken 12 hours apart and it can be taken at any time of fever not necessarily in the spike of fever and preferably you have to do it before anti malarials okay so um, the one major limitation will be if there is any sequestration of parasites it may not be shown on the smear that is a one limitation uh, which can be countered by doing the rdt so the rdt is as uh, taken a uh, uh, like important um, um, thing in the diagnosis of malaria and it, it is found to be very useful so this is a kit which contains uh, which identifies a malarial antigens 
and the kit contains monoclonal antibodies against the malarial antigen. So the commonly tested antigens are histamine rich proteins against plasmodium falciparum and lactate dehydrogenase, uh, which can be for vivax or uh, falciparum, or it can be a pan species LDH. So the different combinations of kits are available. I will show you. And it can be done with a very like a five microliter of blood, and this can be ready within 10 to 20 minutes. So this is one of the tests. So used for RDT. So this is a two-band test which identifies Vivax and Falciparum. And um, we have like uh, a pan pan parasite and a falciparum kit also is available. Um, so if if the control line is not visible, it is considered as invalid. Okay. So this identifies antigen may even when there is sequestration, unlike in a smear study. Uh, there are a few limitations like uh, the false negative, if it's a very low parasite densities, it may not be, it, it cannot be picked up by the RDTs. Uh, but even when the, if it, it may show a faint line like that. So if the clinical correlation is there, maybe you can take it as positive. So if the antigen or antibody levels are very high, that is a, what is called a prozone effect. It may interfere with these uh, RDTs. And a few very rarely like genetic variations of HRP or any poor expression of LDH may interfere with this test positivity. And present the rheumatoid factor may give a false negative, false positive result. And uh, one of the major limitations is you cannot assess the density of parasitemia and you can't assess the response to treatment. Because even after the malaria has been cleared, the antigen may present, it may give a um, positive report even when the patient has been cured. So comparing with the PCR, it is a uh, uh, found to be very useful the sensitivity and specificity is around 80 to 90 percent so you can like very well use it so only you need to know how to use it and uh, as i shown the positive thing has to be read properly so one more test which can be done for malaria is the quantitative puffy coat so you take blood in a capillary tube and then centrifuge it so with the tube will have acted in orange stain which will be picked up by the malarial parasite and it can be seen under the fluorescent microscope so it is also again a very fast and reliable test, but you need a fluorescent microscope to see this. Uh, and when you suspect cerebral malaria, like uh, what are the tests you can do? Definitely you are going to order for lumbar puncture, which uh, like um, shows an increased pressure. Uh, so this is not very like uh, diagnostic of cerebral malaria, but uh, um, the one finding like malarial retinopathy has said to be uh, very specific for cerebral malaria. You can look for these findings like uh, uh, retinal hemorrhages, uh, macular white patches, macular whitening or vessel changes. You can ask for um, any ophthalmologist in our area to look for the fundus and uh, if these findings are there, it, it's found to be specific for cerebral malaria. It should be give a clue in any patient with ALOC because uh, we can get a combination of anything like that. So this finding will give a clue towards cerebral malaria. Going for the management, so once you have diagnosed and uh, the management of Vivax is going to be very easy. So it's a uh, chloroquine 25 milligram per kg given at 10, 10 and 5 on day 1, 2, 3. Um, and if it is a Vivax, you can you give a dose of primacune of 0.25 milligram per kg for 14 days for radical treatment. And for uh, calciparum, a single dose of 0.75 milligram of primacune is given. So avoid empirical antimalarial. So even if you suspect uh, don't try to give antimalarials empirically for the risk of emergence of resistance. So try to confirm it by any of the tests I have mentioned so that you can avoid resistance and then you can treat uh, malaria. What are things to be noted while giving chloroquine? Like avoid giving chloroquine in empty stomach and in where the patient has high fever. And if the patient vomits the medicine within 30 or 40 minutes, repeat the dose, don't count the dose and repeat the dose. And G6PD screening is preferably to be done in all patients before starting primacine for risk of hemolysis. And in infants, it's not advised because a relatively G6PD deficient. And if there is a borderline G6PD deficiency, primacine can be given as a weekly dose in the dose of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 milligram per kg for six weeks. What? Uh, so, uh, if it is a Vivax and chloroquine, so the resistance of chloroquine for Vivax is very rare. Even though it has been reported in uh, like uh, even in India, but in our area, it's uh, not very common. You can go for a um, chloroquine. If it is a falciparum, uh, you can directly start artisanate-based combination therapy. Uh, avoid any monotherapy with these drugs. So um, the, the dose will be artisanate. Oral dose is 4 mg per kg once a day for three days. It's the uh, administration of sulfur on day one. Um, 
here there is a risk of monotherapy, but please try to avoid it. So we have a co-formulated tablets or a syrups are available. Uh, it's artemether is rumifantin. So 20 mg, 120 mg is available. So, so that's the dose band we are following. Okay. So artesanate mefloquine is not commonly followed in our region. So you can just skip it. So what do you do if you have diagnosed a, a complicated or severe malaria? See here the drug of choice is IV artesanate. The dose will be 2.4 milligram per kg. So you dilute it and give it as a IV push. So the second dose is repeated 12 hours. And then um, next day you continue as a OD dose. So uh, if the patient is sick, at least you continue parental for 24 hours, even if the patient becomes normal, even with one or two doses. And then you can complete the course with artemether lumifantin or sulfur with sulfuroxin pyrimetamine combination. So what do you do if you have a severe malaria, a severe anemia in uh, malaria with a hemoglobin less than 4 or PCB less than 12, you go for a PRBC transfusion. And uh, as I told, algid malaria, the other patient is present is shock. So it's mostly due to secondary bacterial infection, treat with antibiotics. So the take home will be like uh, suspect malaria in all patients with fever, uh, confirm by any of the immunizations what I have told and then you treat. Uh, watch for complications by a systemic approach. Keep in mind all the um, um, types of severe malaria and then manage symptomatically. Uh, if there is a poor response, either it could be a mixed infection, but before thinking that, you check the dosage and the compliance of the drug. A rule of disease pretty deficiency before giving promacin. Now, advise vector control measures to patients to avoid uh, relapses. So, thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Rekha Marnath, for a very short and correct presentation. And we have got questions which will be taken up in the question and answer session. Thank you. To the participants, a kind request from the organizing team. We need more topics from your side. Whatever the topics you feel which is going to be, which are going to be useful in your practice, please put them on in the chat box. These topics will be taken up in the future CMEs. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Balaji to start his lecture on scrub typhus. Dr. Balaji. So good evening, sir. Good evening. He is uh, sir, he's, I'm audible, uh, sir. My slides are visible, sir. Yes, sir. He is a pediatrician, neonatologist, and senior assistant professor of government Dharmapuri Medical College Hospital, Dharmapuri. His field of interest is pediatric emergency and critical care. He has published in leading journals and co authored in textbooks. Uh, so good evening, sir. Uh, am I audible and my slides are visible, sir? Yes, sir. Please yes, share sir. your slide. Uh, first of all, I uh, good evening, one and all. I first of all, I thank our IAP office players, Dr. Ramesh Professor, Dr. Rajan Nelson, Dr. Gopal, sir, and our convener, uh, our guru, Dr. Tangivel, sir, for giving this opportunity, and uh, Dr. Salun, sir, for uh, <clears throat> helping us to present this presentation today. We'll go over the presentation straightly. So, my topic for today's discussion is uh, scrap typers. So actually, uh, coming to scrub, uh, there are a lot of questions or a lot of scenarios usually will come and arise in the every pediatrician mind during his practice. I will try to answer some of the questions, uh, answer by some of the questions will arise in our uh, every pediatrician's mind. So scrub typus uh, was now considered as one of the common tropical infection in India. It is uh, really common or how common? So there are some studies published in India. The study from Central India showed that around 45% of cases were turned to be recursal diseases, including strep typus, while evaluating the fewer cases. Uh, we also done a uh, study in around in 2011 and 12 when we sent the all fewer cases for uh, investigation that turned to be around 40% cases were turned to be strep positive. So another study done in the all ICU of uh, all over India showed that. Uh, scrub typus was the second commonest cause of tropical fever in India. So why this much is common? What is the organism causing this much problem? Why this much disease in, in our India? So it's a scrub typus is caused by uh, bacteria, orientia, shushuka machine. 
it is mainly transmitted through the bite of an infected uh, larval stage of trombicled mite that's called chigar so when a child or patients while walking or sitting lying on the infested ground the chigar bite and transmit the disease to the human beings so here the main main problem is the reservoir the field mice is one of the important reservoir which will cause infection in both rural and urban areas in our country so why this re emerging or why this much increase uh, scenario of scrub nowadays in uh, india is there is a change in land use land cover and uh, mainly urbanization population explosion and uh, strain on sanitation mainly increased diversion of forest land for agriculture uses so because of this the common uh, organs of the chigar which usually wear uh, seen in the rice fields low lying trees bushes river banks and uh, poorly maintained kitchen gardens and grassy lands will bite the humans and cause the scrub type cause in human beings Sorry for the interruption. Just a minute. Malaji, you might present without your video, or if you have a hotspot in your phone, you can use it. That will prevent interruption of the Wi-Fi. Yes. Just a minute, sir. So my slides are visible, sir. Yes, yes, visible. Just a minute. I cannot move the slides. Yes, it's not moving. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Very sorry. You can click on the slide and then try to move, sir. Maybe if you click somewhere else, it may not move, sir. Yes, sir. Fine. So because of this uh, main uh, increased diversion of forest land for agricultural use and uh, where our uh, all the public are using uh, going for lands and doing yoga and uh, jogging and everything, their increased exposure to this chigar bite will cause. Uh, in portion of this uh, scrub in, in today's population sir so we are telling that uh, uh, scrub but uh, for the past one hour all the tropical fevers are discussed so far but uh, what are the key clinical features to diagnose scrub so now we see the case scenario here a 5 year old male child brought fever for 6 days uh, child is having shock with increased uh, crt and ca increased uh, capillary fever time and a pale with a generalized edema on examination child is having aptospleno megaly with thrombocytopenia with anemia and the pediatric practitioner send the case for ultrasound a radiologist gave the report that gb oil edema with mild ascites suggest of viral hemorrhagic fever in this juncture uh, so either pediatrician may start uh, managing this case as a dengue or feel that the case is sick may refer but here there are some clues any case came with acute febrile illness with lymphadenopathy along with hepatomegaly with splenomegaly along with thrombocytopenia if there is anemia and capillary leak which will lead to generalized sedima please look at eschar at hidden areas so if you find the eschar it obviously give the clue that we are diagnosed of scrub typhus these are the key clinical features for scrub typhus but the thing is so many clinical features are shared by the, all the tropical infections but your main thing to diagnose scrub you have to look for is eschar at hidden areas that is the main thing so now everybody talking about eschar what is eschar and where to look for Eschar is the single most diagnostic clue in scrub typhus. It is a single painless eschar with an erythematous or black ring on the site of the stinger bite, usually seen from around 7 to 9, 7 to 97 percent of population in scrub typhus cases in various studies. Usually, it is found in areas where skin is thin, moist, or wrinkled, and where clothing is tight. But usually, these places will be patient may not notice, and also the practitioner also usually. Uh, may not look at these places the places are axilla genitalia scalp 
Inguinal area, perineum, and neck, and begin the earth. These are the places usually in the astral will be seen, but where we all missed it. So after the initial painless and unnoticed bite of the bacteria, it is multiplied at the inoculation site. Initially, there will be a painless papil, which will lead to ulcerate, necrotic, then regional, then generalized lymphoid in the body. In this juncture, if we don't intervene, the, then the disease will lead to disseminated disease with the complications. You can see the escher, the various stage of escher with the evaluation. Here is the macular papillar lesion, it is an ulcerate lesion, it is a typical black color escher. So it is a various stage of escher, and duration of the illness will tell us the, uh, according to the duration of the illness, the escher morphology may change. So it is here, it is seen in the axilla, here over the cheek, here at the genitalia, at below the scrotum. So once, uh, but many things, as the escher was not identified earlier, the most of the streptococcus cases end up with complications. Then what are the complications and how to look for? But just to see the scenario, four-year-old girl presented with fever, cough, and cold, and headache for more than one week duration with breathlessness for the past two days, as saturation is falling around 80%. Uh, just the, as the child is some ARDS like picture, all the bacterial causes were ruled out. They were think that as a swine flu and H1N1 and plant referral. So here, another uh, case scenario here, just uh, two months back in the COVID scenario, 18 years old male brought with fever, cough and cold for one week and breathless for the past two, two days with the desaturation. Obviously, everybody will think that it's a COVID pneumonia. This on evaluation, this patient have hepatitis splenomegaly and raised serum creatinine and raised LFT parameters. But uh, both the cases were out as care and finally diagnosed as Screptypus. So in screptypus, whenever there is, a, after the first week, the, when the patient goes to second week, though most of the cases end up with complications. In the, if these complications were not recognized earlier, the mortality is quite high, up to 40 to 60%. So the most common complications were ERDS, as I mentioned earlier, and shock, which were also closely mimicked to dengue shock, and many times elevated bilirubin and SGOT, SGPT may be seen in our screptypus cases. And in late cases, there may be serum creatine will be elevated, presented as renal failure. And uh, screptypus presented as seen as manifestation were reported in so many studies. And even we have received sudden loss of hearing loss as well as sudden loss of vision with the pancreatitis, GMRH. And severe cases may go for severe myocarditis and final DAAC and multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. If the same scrub affects the pregnancy, there may be a possibility of abortions, IUD, and preterm diaper also. So it affects the pregnancy as well as the newborn also. These are the complications. So any uh, acute febrile illness came after one week, even though you are thinking of scrub, all, always look for any breathlessness and respiratory rate and falling of saturation and look for uh, peripheral pulses felt or not, CRT prolonged or not. Because unless otherwise you may pick up the, these complications, the mortality is quite high. So another quite com important complication in streptypus is shock. But in many times, it is closely mimicked to dengue shock. But how to differentiate whether it's a dengue or a scrub? In dengue, you all know that initially our Rajmas are clearly tells that in dengue, you all know that past three days, there will be a fever. After that, there will be a leaky phase. There is a febrile period. The child, so platelet count, everything will go down. The patient will go for capillary leak and shock. But in screptypus, the shock usually accompanies the fever. There is a persistent fever. And along with hepatomegaly, there is a soft splenomegaly. You look for the BP. In dengue, there is usually narrow post pressure shock. But in screptypus, the BP may be 120 or 110 like that. The pulse pressure will be wide. So uh, finally, if you if diagnose scrub and you start the doxycycline, the drug of choice for scrub, along with your fluids and inotropes, the response will be very quite good. So if you see the difference in scrub type, as I already mentioned, there will be hepatosplenomegaly in dengue, massive hepatomegaly. If you ask your radiologist uh, friend, if you look for abdominal lymphadenopathy, there may be periailar and hepatic lymphadenopathy may be seen in scrub typers. The fluid leak usually very much common in, more fluid leak common in dengue. So there may be more ascites and bilateral fluid effusion. But in scrub typers, there is mild ascites and mild fluid effusion. And coming to investigation, usually in scrub typers, there is CRP will be elevated and leukocytosis. In dengue, you all know that there will be leukopenia and CRP usually normal. And during shock period in dengue, there is elevated hematocrit, whereas in scrub typers, during shock, hematocrit may be normal or low. With this, 
differentiating features you can usually you can easily identify whether you are dealing with a scrub or dengue okay you come you are look for ester you identified ester you uh, you think that it's a case of scrub type then how will you confirm it is a case of scrub you will do whale flux test which is very commonly available we'll see but in whale flux test is here atropyl antibody test it's a cheap though it is available in many places it is a, uh, it is not a very good sensitive and specific test so it's not recommended the best test is igm elisa technique which is a good sensitive and specific specific ct but is but but the only thing is it is usually positive after 5 to 7 days of onset of disease if you don't have uh, igm elisa uh, test to do for your cases there is there are rapid immunochromatographic tests for detection of igg and igm antibodies are available which is also uh, very have good sensitivity specificity the studies are published from south korea it is available in every places if you if this rapid test are positive you are sure that you are dealing with a case of scrub typus other investigations are not available and quite expensive not much useful for the day to day practice but you confirm the case of scrub but your case is one year old child how will you treat because from our, our undergraduate teaching doxycycline is not at all recommended for less than 8 years it is say our uh, everybody taught this lesson but it is easy to but it's not like that american academy of pediatrics mentioned even in 1997 that the doxycycline can be used for all the recurrent diseases even less than 8 years of age because the common side of what we thought teeth discoloration occurs only after multiple days of therapy so the first line of drug for scrub papers is doxycycline the dose is 4.5 mg per kg per day in two divided doses should be given with plenty of fluid during the meals but this the doxycycline should be given for at least 7 days or at least 3 days of epibrary period to avoid the relapses but many time the doxycycline is the base of problem is the child will vomit the capsule but nowadays tablets are available which can be given to child easily the second drug is azithromycin can be given a dose of 10 mg per kg for 5 days it is very safe in pregnant women and children when the doxycycline was not tolerated by children you can choose azithromycin for those cases but when our most of the scrub type of cases because of the late diagnosis brought with complicated with a severe shock or ads like picture in this juncture our iv doxycycline and iv azithromycin are quite available nowadays it can be given for these sick cases but the main thing is these are both the drugs should be given as iv infusion over 1 to 3 hours it should not be given as a bolus because doxycycline can cause thromboplebitis and azithromycin if you give iv bolus it causes prolonged qt interval and sudden arrest the child may die so it is a, the important thing is these iv preparations are very much useful whenever you are receiving the complicated cases but you should be given as infusion at the same time once a child is stable you, you should have switch over to the oral therapy other drugs second line drugs are clarithromycin and telithromycin and roxithromycin Rifampicin is also helpful, but those drugs are uh, held for a second line drug only because it is may rifampicin use, but tuberculosis also. So, even, so the first drugs in Asitro are very much helpful in any case of scrub typus. As we, for the past uh, one hour, we are dealing with the tropical fever. If you see that all the cases have a similar manifestation, is there a possibility of mixed infection? Just we see a case scenario. Here, a four-year-old boy have fear of for more than one week. the child was sick having shock abdomen pain and distress and two episode of hematemesis the child was uh, dengue was positive child was managed as per dengue protocol but here the child is in spite of the management child is not improving there is a persistent fever and worsening ads where the child was managed with more of uh, inotropes and uh, ventilator support but on careful examination you can see that there is a esker at the genital area of penis which give clues that we are dealing with a case of scrub We, along with the uh, supportive measures we have started an iv doxycycline the child improved fantastically so in any if you see the all tropical infections there is a mixed infections are possible among dengue malaria typhoid leptospirosis and sepsis also then now to so this is another case where scrub with malaria both are positive there is esker in the neck region so actually any infections if you are giving if you have some clinical diagnosis you are managing as per your standard protocol after 48 hours so the child is not improving it may be a scrub please look for a scrub at the hidden areas or if you diagnose as a scrub you start at doxy after 48 hours of doxy treatment the child is having persistent fever if there may be some other mixed infection is possible this is the message i want to convey here 
so we all uh, know that when the child brought with a late stage there is a quite com- there are a lot of complication can i manage complication yes even you can manage complication easily so for respiratory distress the oxygen through jackson is circuit or early non invasive ventilation so very much helpful will save the patient even without invasive ventilation we can we are saved so many children with these measures and another thing is a shock for the shock the proper fluid boluses and inotropes are quite helpful in scrub typers along with iv docs are also through when these children brought with a severe shock so inotropes and iv docs and supportive measures save the life of the child so we are talking about escar is this possible in multiple escar in scrub type yes it is reported in adults around 0.8 to 2.2% but usually escars are mainly under reported under diagnosed because in hidden areas and another formation of escar mainly depends upon the various recurrent serotypes and host factors alone so that's why it is reported from 10% to 90% according to serotypes it varies from according to country to country another uh, a dilemma is there a pseudo thrombocytopenia present in scrub yes it's also reported it is mainly due to in vivo edta anticoagulant dependent artifactual thrombocytopenia it is mainly because of the platelet clumping which will lead to the pseudo thrombocytopenia if you look at the wbc histogram there is a left peak and in platelet histogram it is a short tooth appearance which will give clue that we are dealing with pseudo thrombocytopenia but how to solve the problem if you have the perfect complete peripheral smear examination we could identify identify the exact platelet count of the patient and otherwise you can do the reanalysis using the sodium citrate or heparin as the anticoagulant but most of the time in scrub typers uh, we are not able we are not necessary to give the platelet transfusion so therapeutic implications are not much here but uh, the another uh, difference between scrub and uh, dengue in dengue there is a rapid fall of platelet whereas in scrub usually there is a gradual fall only senior we are all talking about escar is only seen in scrub or in some other conditions this question may arise in every practitioner so it may seen in other recurrential conditions like recurrential pox and tick pox and meningococcemia and cutaneous anthrax cutaneous leishmaniasis and ecthema gangrenosum due to pseudomonas infection and spider bite and tularemia and even fungal infections like aspergillosis but all these conditions there will be quite edema and painful so most of the time attender will give clue that are will brought with this particular problem but in scrub type as it is a painless ulcer most of the time no patient will come and complain that i am having the ulcer or ester deeden areas if you ask the question inga punnu irukengla alla edavad chinna da kopla mari iruka abin to ketta one da they will tell that very rarely otherwise you have to look for the hidden areas to identify the ester so we all thinking about the diagnosis and treatment is it preventable can we prevent yes it's mainly due to the chigger bite so we can avoid by protective clothing and we avoid to sit or lie on the bare ground or grass use a suitable ground sheet or other ground cover and to avoid the mite bite we can use the insect repellents and miticides like benzyl benzoate and thiethylcholamide and you can it can be applied to the skin or clothing also there is a chemo prophylaxis of single dose of doxycycline weekly once for 6 weeks can be also recommended to prevent the scrub typhus to conclude this uh, my session so you all for the past one hour we are all talking about the tropical fevers if you see the clinical pictures most of the times all the tropical fevers they share the same clinical pictures like a fever thrombocytopenia anemia hepatomegaly spinomegaly so it always confuse the practitioners while dealing with the cases but only one thing will catch the diagnosis is escar but either you can look for or you can train your staff nurses or your assistants whenever the child brought with fever of more than 5 days uh, uh, to look for the hidden areas mainly begin the ear neck or and axilla and buttocks groins or genital areas look for the escar and ask the patient any punnu or ulcer like lesion present in the particular areas this will give to that you are dealing with a scrub because many time under diagnosis and delay diagnosis you are referring the case and another thing when you ask this finding most of the time the parents may not notice at all but if identified that without seeing there is some ulcer in that they are very happy that our doctor identified that this is exactly and they praise you also because by identifying scrub typers early you are not only saving the child it is it will reduce the expensive po workup and it will reduce the treatment cost and obviously we are not necessary to use the 
excessive antibiotics which will reduce the antibiotic resistance this is my take home message please uh, look for escort in hidden areas year after any acute undifferentiated fever so i thank once again iap tamil nadu and uh, my <coughs> my thangal sir and solam sir and all the uh, my all the people to help me to present this presentation and thank you once and all for kind uh, kind attention and uh, nice opportunity thank you thank you thank you very much thank you dr balaji for an excellent presentation before all the participants leave please put your at least one topic of your choice which you want it to be discussed in the future cmas now i request professor tangavel sir to take over the question and answer session thank you very much sir uh, thank you selvan you, you also part of the discussion i want all the faculty to be and the faculty and chair person to be on the screen yes sir thank you it was a <clears throat> wonderful presentation by everyone balaji you really uh, presented this in a, such a nice way that everything is photographic you have proof uh, that your patient sorry sir uh, balaji stop uh, slide sorry balaji is a wonderful presentation Thanks, photographic sir. presentation in fact uh, you have shown the proof that all your patients are recovered from strep typhus thanks uh, to ramesh babu and others for giving good encouragement for you to manage critically ill children in uh, dharmapuri i think uh, what we were managing some 10 10 years ago in icih you have been doing that job great great work and great presentation uh, thank you sir all, thank you all the four faculty very nicely presented even though we yes, we restrained them with uh, time limitations they did a wonderful job i am much thankful to them for a very clear uh, message in fact if, from every talk i learned something new i think most of our teachers will agree to that uh, we will go on to the question and session that rajkumar has seen the questions in the chat box yes sir so i went through all the question and answers so he is ready with the question and answers yes sir. i went through the all the chat box almost 200 250 messages are going on and i collected uh, questions asked about my topics sir dengue fever so dr jalil he has asked the first question he has asked whether immature platelet uh, fraction and platelet volume are they the same one or different so the question, the answer is they are different sir the platelet volume is different platelet volume is something like you no know, our main corpus callosum volume of rbc and the immature platelet fraction is nothing but i told in the presentation it is like reticulocytes this immature platelet fraction they are the one which are pinched off from the megagaryocytes and they are you know in one or two days they are going to become the platelets they are different actually so it is uh, other way around i just wanted to know whether in, in ipc yes, is expensive we can use in place of ipc platelet volume yes sir definitely sir platelet because volume because it is, is depict, depicted in the cold counter yes sir yes sir even in the three part it is coming so platelet volume what they say uh, normally it is less than 10 if it is more actually 10 to 15 we can expect that the platelet count is going to increase in another 24 to 48 24 hours actually that so, is the main reason for asking sir so thank you sir so one more question you asked actually the deng score you asked about crystalloid and colloid how it can alter the outcomes sir definitely any child who is going to receive crystalloid colloid they come under that 11% category they have deng hemorrhagic fever probably going on to develop deng shock syndrome so definitely any child who is receiving crystalloid colloid they come under severe category sir these children they should not be managed in the primary care level they should be referred to the secondary or tertiary care center so the next question is asked by major ilangovan he asked two questions the first question is why females are at high risk i put in the slide females so it's all genetics actually you know in covid we know that males are at higher risk they you know uh, in the death you know on the worldwide what they found out almost two third of deaths are uh, uh, from the males in covid similarly in then the female uh, the gender actually gives you know it's it gives a more risk to the uh, person and there are more chance of a female developing dem hemorrhagic fever or deng shock syndrome than a male actually uh, we don't know the reason sir it's all genetics sir uh, the second question asked by him is ns1 positivity actually so is there any difference between day 1 to day 5 day 1 you have more positivity day 5 less positivity no sir the answer is ns1 it is a non structural antigen it you know it's associated with the deng viremia it is a all or none phenomenon either it is present or it is absent 
there is no difference between day 1 to 5 actually uh, dr tangaraj has asked how long ns1 would be positive it is positive from day 1 to day 7 sir during the viremic period and in immediately after the viremic period of one or two days this ns1 antigen would be positive and uh, prc sir actually he has given an excellent suggestion actually because of want of time i didn't say sir he has he told that for, for opd management there should be a excellent good communication between the doctor and parents and parent must be educated about deng and follow up beyond fever deprivation definitely sir very uh, your points are well taken sir and uh, finally one question asked by tangaraj regarding how early the third spacing occurs in deng and scrub dr balaji is currently put in his one one of his slide the deng usually it happens on the fourth end of fourth day and the fifth day while scrub it can happen even on the third day this uh, third spacing so these are the questions asked about the deng sir thank you thank you rajkumar you are nicely managed both question and answers how we move on to uh, and i think you are given a very nice uh, feeling that a ba man is uh, safer than his home in the dengue <laughs> so dengue is safer than wife so that's what the message you told so men can feel happy about it so but move covid on to... actually it, it kills <laughs> us <sir. laughs> okay it depends on the illness <laughs> So moving on to Dr. Dashaini. Uh, Dashaini, I have two, three questions. First question is uh, there is one question from chat box is some of the companies have ad uh, advised second dose for the typhoid TCV. What is your uh, view or uh, do you agree with that? So as per IAP, ACVIP, um, treatments uh, typhoid conjugate vaccine as a single dose uh, anytime uh, between. it can be started any time between 6 months to 9 months and up to 45 years sir but the dose is only a single 0.5 ml dose um, only polysaccharide vaccines can be treated uh, after 3 years sir. this is the recommendation from the acvap and second question is um, have you read or have you come across septreaction resistance in salmonella typhi in india in indian uh, subcontinent Have we come across? Have we seen any case reports where there is resistant to septreaxone in salmonella typhi? Not in Indian subcontinent, sir. But there are papers uh, from Pakistan and uh, Iran, which uh, Iraq, uh, which have shown uh, resistance to third generation septreaxone. Not in Indian subcontinent. Not in the papers. Um. Another question from Professor Nadinjalian. Basically, so, we have seen cases of delayed decompression, sir. But still, as suggested, we should uh, wait and continue the same drug. Uh, question from Professor Nadinjalian. Uh, the culture is not available everywhere. So, what is the alternative test to prove or confirm typhoid? Sir, not viral, sir. Though we do it, um, typhoid dot and uh, typhoid uh, IgM is better. but it definitely does not replace uh, blood culture um, so put together this can be done in uh, clinical background of enteric fever but uh, this does not definitely replace uh, blood culture I, in this context i just want to pass on a request to the senior practicing community pediatricians in their own town in their own town every community pediatrician is almost like a king whatever he says it will happen he can organize anything i request all the community pediatricians to organize culture facilities in the lab where you practice that i think we have we have created everything no beautiful uh, whatsapp uh, setup and computers are available even in a smaller town and villages so i request the community pediatrician senior pediatricians to organize culture facilities in their own town with the lab i think this should be pass definitely possible third another question but already dr jo bennett has answered it but still i want to hear from you after recovering from typhoid when do you advise a typhoid vaccination so it is recommended four weeks after uh, recovery from uh, typhoid either suspected and treated typhoid or confirmed typhoid it should be given four weeks after recovery sir thank you uh... Dakshayani, we'll move on to Dr. Ekam Bharnath. In the meantime, uh, uh, Dakshayani, again we are given a responsibility. Kindly go through the chat box; we can never escape chat box and see any oh, questions which I remained unanswered, so that uh, that my missed oh, old okay. eyes, my young eyes can pick it up. So I uh, to Dr. Ekam Bharnath, 
Yes, sir. So, uh, what is the role of quinine? Have you used quinine? What is the role of quinine? Is there any? I, I, yeah, I guess, sir. During my PG period, we are we are using only quinine, sir. But the the incidence of hypoglycemia and arrhythmias are quite high, sir. So, under this artesanate is very safe, and we very rarely experience uh, problems with artesanate. It can be given as IV push, and uh, it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't even need an ICU setup. Quinine can be given only under cardiac monitoring. And risk of hypoglycemia, even in malaria, is high, and uh, with quinine, it's even very high. So uh, nowadays, we very rarely use quinine, and uh, I think artesanate has become very common. And uh, resistance to artesanate, so far, it's not very, so far, has not been reported. So you can very well use artesanate in severe malaria. Thank you, thank, thank you, Agamar Nath. I think in our period when we were in ICH or uh, with the PRC, Shanti, and then we used quinine widely because that time. Artesanate was not available in the yes, government. Even system. during so my we PGA, was used was uh, mm. it was really safer only. We didn't have any problem with quinine. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, one more question, can, sir. Mm. How to differentiate respiratory distress due to different uh, uh, thing? Um, I think I think, many... I think that is a topic suggested for the future uh, oh, oh, okay. sessions. I I feel so. I think so. Okay, sir. And. Uh, other questions? I don't find any question, other questions for you. Yes, sir. I think that uh, is only one. Dr. Anik can find out. In the meantime, we'll move on to cut type first. Um, Professor Nenjana has asked a question. Any other uh, liquid cell infection is seen in Tamil Nadu? Because uh, um, Balaji has widely seen and even published an article on cut type uh, To my knowledge, I also have not seen anything other than cut type Do you see any liquid cell infection is... Present in Tamil Nadu or India, other than step typhus. Balaji unmute. Balaji unmute. Present or Balaji. Balaji unmute. Sir, actually in Tamil Nadu, apart from step typhus, so far not reported, sir. But in India, murine typhus, Rickards, Indian tick typhus, and Q fever were reported in all the other states, sir, actually. Okay, how do they present? They present like this one or present like a fever? Uh, sir, more or less same, sir. But I actually, yes, it is uh, uh, not char characteristically seen only in script papers only, sir, actually. That's the thing. Most of the presentations are like that same and the management also same. That's a God's grace. Uh, we can manage uh, most of the cases uh, in similar uh, manner, sir. Actually. Sir, uh, we have seen uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fevers, sir. Spotted oh, okay. fevers. Uh, hmm. Sp spotted fevers we have seen. We have proved it by immunofluorescence also the positivity. The presentation will be mainly rashes. Did they have uh, a scar? Er Erthematous macular papular rashes. Hmm. Rashes become very prominent during the fever. They become palpable and involvement of palms and soles. So and uh, this uh, disease, just like Sir had said, just like scrub typhus, by first week, if you don't real recognize it, it goes on to the fifth or seventh day. It goes in for a vasculitis uh, phenomenon where you can get gangrene. Oh. Uh, this rash come from uh, periphery to, to center, I think. Uh, we have seen spotted fever, sir, in Coimbatore. Okay, this rash comes from periphery to center. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And the management? management? Management is the same, the sir. Same. There is no difference. Doxycycline. Earlier, it used to be chloramphenicol. Those days, 20 years back, we have used chloramphenicol. But now the drug of choice is uh, uh, doxycycline. Did they, did they have SCAR? No, sir. No SCAR. Okay. No SCAR. And Vinny, you remember we spotted one yes, in Yes, yes. We, we have picked uh, up this is quite some time back. Yes. Okay, spotted okay, fever. Okay, yeah. Spotted fever. Okay. Did, they are the DD for exanthematous fevers. Yes, sir. What yes. day is appeared? First week or later? Uh, it, within three to five days, you will get the rashes, sir. Oh. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Dr. Jalil and Dr. Nandini for sharing sir, your... Uh, yeah, one, can I take one yeah, minute, sir? Uh, please. Uh. Sir, being a tropical fever is a very important topic. Yeah. I just wanted to tell one about the bradycardia, relative bradycardia and onset of bradycardia. Relative bradycardia and entry fever, <laughs> onset of bradycardia, recovery in dengue fever. And the ESR. ESR, low ESR, eosinophilia like that. It is common in dengue fever. We come across in uh, so many lectures. That's my point. Thank, Thank you very much. So, like Thank one child uh, with a spotted fever was diagnosed as Kawasaki uh, and then was given IVIG therapy. The, mm. the coronary artery involvement was just marginal, mild dilatation. And then when we went and saw for the second opinion, after no response to IVIG, classically child had liver, spleen, then the rashes, involvement of palms and soles. 
the with the uh, taking doxycycline within 24 hours there was effervescence oh fantastic we get lot of information from all the senior practicing pediatricians we learn more more from the participants too yes, so sir. one question one question has just now come sir role of okay. doxycycline in dengue can i answer sir uh, Actually, i'll just complete uh, okay i'll just complete uh, uh, um, Balaji's questions, uh, then okay. you can answer it. Uh, uh, how early third spacing occur in uh, streptophys? It is similar to dengue or different? So how early you seen? Dengue third? usually, after three days, it's starting, sir. But in hmm. scrub, it usually take at least five to seven days, sir, actually. Uh, okay. But it's not uh, very rapid like uh, dengue, sir, actually. The child may present generally sedima, but hmm. uh, not much shock. And uh, ever, ever fluctuation of the fluid leak is not quite common. So in dengue, the diagnosis is easy, management is tough. But in scrub, diagnosis is tough. But if you diagnose exactly the management, if you have proper uh, treatment, you can save the cell in so many times, actually. Okay. Uh, now, um, Rajkumar can answer the question. There's one more question also from Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Sir, there is another question for uh, Balaji, sir. sir. How long uh, will fever persist in scrub titles? Balaji, how Actually, long the fever persists in In literature, it is reported at 20, up to 26 days, sir, actually. So oh, it is, 26 uh, days? Yes, sir. The, the first case reported in India, uh, 26 days the child was present with the fever, then only they diagnosed. So most of the time, until the uh, yeah, definitive management is uh, uh, done for the child, the fever may persist for the prolonged period. So it is another differential diagnosis for prolonged period. That's why in sometimes the child present with hepatitis splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, prolonged fever, sometimes it confuses with the diagnosis of tuberculosis as well as malignancy also when the child brought with after two weeks to our uh, uh, medical uh, level three centers actually. Sir. Okay, that is a new information. Thank you, Balaji. Now, Dr. Rajkumar, can you answer the question on doxycycline dengue? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sivaguru Nathan from Trichy has asked this question actually. Mm -hmm. The role of doxycycline. And doxycycline is actually it's a wonder drug, sir. Actually, it, it, it was actually, it has been used for a lot of variety of conditions. And one of the conditions is uh, like, it can be used in dengue fever. That is what uh, research uh, which is being now conduct, is being conducted. Uh, in experimental studies, what they found out actually, you know, the doxycycline, it kills it has direct uh, virucidal effect in uh, uh, in experimental studies and it also is actually a immunomodulatory effect it reduces the pro inflammatory cytokine which are released during the critical phase the cytokine storm actually it gets reduced with uh, doxycycline pre treatment so uh, studies are still going on some studies are showing excellent results the incidence of DHF and DSS are definitely reduced with the pre-treatment with the doxycycline. But this, all these studies have been conducted in adults. In pediatric age group, they have to be conducted. So I hope in future, some studies are being conducted in you know, tropical, especially in India or in Thailand, some studies will be conducted in pediatric age group. And we will be using doxycycline to prevent the incidence of DHF and DSS, especially in children with uh, comorbid conditions. Sir. Thank you, Rajman. Sir, one no, no, suggestion, no, 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 sir, no, no, no. with the talk on dengue, at okay. least you should say not to use this pap papaya extract and uh, the preparations. Yes, definitely. definitely, definitely ma we should uh, tell, uh, add on the message. Yes, ma definitely. Papaya extract is uh, very bitter and uh, sometimes they may produce severe gastritis and uh, they, some children I noticed after taking papaya extract, they have this melina, ma'am, actually. At least we should say not to use these, at least. Not to use, definitely. Exactly. Definitely correct. Papaya should not be used. Correct. Uh, Dr. Dakshani, it's a question sir, from a neurologist about typhoid fever. What are the yes, usual sir. time of deprivations in enteric fever with treating oh, a sensitive sir. antibiotic yes. like ceftriaxone? Yes. What is the maximum sir, dose of what is the dose of ceftriaxone used? In optimally treated cases, the time taken for deprivations is around uh, five to six days. Sir. Um, so the dose of ceftriaxone used will be hundred mg per kg per day in two divided doses for a period of 14 days. Uh, and whenever the child uh, is tolerating orally, we can switch over to oral cefixim at a dose of 10, uh, 20 mg per kg. Uh, the entire duration of treatment, however, should be complete 14 days. It's daily dose of septriaxone. How many milligram per kg? That's what the question I think, Dr. Shani. It was 100 mg per 100 kg. 100 mg only, okay. Two divided doses. Thank you. Rajendra. Sir, uh, ABS sir has asked a question. 
uh, can measles containing vaccine be given alongside a typhoid conjugate vaccine uh, the ideal time to uh, give a typhoid conjugate vaccine would be between 6 to 9 months sir. so if it is started at 6 uh, months it is not a problem so at 9 months when we are uh, also planning to give a typhoid uh, measles containing vaccine the duration between both the vaccine should be at least 4 weeks sir. the typhoid conjugate vaccine and the measles containing vaccine uh, rajendran can we can we have another 5 minutes time some more questions are there or yeah yeah shall i ask one question sir yeah please please sir, in dengue sir we are getting nowadays uh, severe uh, thrombocytopenia like uh, less than 10 uh, 10000 20000 uh, any role of uh, um, that's antd that means uh, 50 microgram per kg definitely sir Yeah. Yes, sir. definitely anti-D immunoglobulin as a very, very, very good role, sir. Actually, I uh, because want of time, I didn't put all those things, sir. Because I think so. Kumar Ittal, I think they had uh, done study. I think in 2017. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. It has a role, sir. We used, sir. Even in Madurai, we used one for one case. Yes. Okay, sir. What about the Tangvel, sir? Opinion, your opinion, sir. We, I, we have not used. Sir. I have not seen any paper. I don't know how far it will be helpful. Uh, uh, because uh, I don't know whether how far it is going to help us. But one more thing is in dengue more than the correcting the platelet count other things are important correct the shock correcting the hepatic failure other things probably i should not divert us from uh, main issues yeah And i don't have, i don't experience about using anti day in thrombocytopenia yeah correct sir but this year we are getting malaria more we are getting uh, even uh, we are having six or seven cases of malaria also and uh, severe bleed also this time i after 5 6 years later now we are getting just uh, for discussion only i think it is a uh, 2017 it uh, indian society of critical care medicine it was a published article and also a lot of studies also there okay no. sir please uh, one more question is asked about the role of steroids in improving platelets in dengue fever sir so steroid has they have no role in, in the management of dengue fever especially in the first 5 days if you use steroids it's literally a death sentence for the patient because steroids actually worsen the course of illness and actually they exacerbated that uh, antibody mediated uh, immune damage and so the incidence of dhf and dhs are very very high in patients who are pre treated with steroids so they have no role at all even during the critical phase the use of steroids they didn't give any benefit at all a meta study uh, showed the no role of i mean no benefit for with steroids sir. so steroids have no role I, I, in the management of dengue fever i should compliment rajkumar sir for putting that one particular slide about nscid that mechanism and the product is an excellent message thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank you thank you jali rajkumar so and uh, that is sir will take one minute one minute and uh, dr ninjalai has asked a question the platelet aggregation is considered to be one of the features causing pseudo thrombocytopenia in uh, scrub typhus uh, how, how common it is and can this be used as an index of diagnosis of scrub typhus let's say test for scrub actually, typhus actually uh, balaji A study published from Chennai showed that around 80% of uh, scrub typhus have pseudo thrombocytopenia, sir. Actually, but uh, we cannot take it as a diagnosis for scrub typhus because it is a in vitro uh, mechanism because of DDTA induced uh, antibody reaction. It is seen in uh, drug induced reactions and malignancy and other CS also. So it is seen in uh, scrub typhus. We can take the message, but uh, pseudo thrombocytopenia is not the marker for uh, scrub typhus alone, sir. Actually. so with that we cannot diagnose but when the patient brought with uh, low platelet count it is better to differentiate whether it's a true or pseudo for uh, purpose of treatment only so what are the indications of steroids in uh, typhoid fever dr dakshay i was just about to answer that earlier um, uh, steroids were indicated in all severe cases like uh, cases of typhoid uh, encephalopathy Uh, children who presented with sto stupor, coma, and uh, typhoid shock, uh, steroids were indicated earlier. But now the recommendations are nil for steroids in treatment of typhoid fever. One question to Balaji: How long the time taken for the platelets to improve in scrub typhus? Actually, in scrub typhus, you start the specific management with the doxycycline. The platelet will start increasing by the next day itself. Usually, it won't take much time like dengue. So another uh, it's a platelet uh, fall also not very rapid like dengue it's a gradual and uh, once you start the management uh, all the parameters both the clinical as well as lab parameters start improving from 24 to 48 hours itself sir actually 
So that's why in strep typus, that if you diagnose exactly, if you start this specific treatment, the outcome is very good, though the child brought with complications. So, uh, PRC sir has asked uh, why uh, quinolones can still be used if, when there are they are contraindicated in pediatric age group. Uh, as such, they are not routinely indicated in children, sir. But uh, very um, resistant cases, um, in cases of select cases of clinical failure and relapses, quinolones can be used as a reserve drug for children more than uh, eight years of age. But uh, the present SGG also does not support the use of uh, quinolones at all. Uh, but this has been uh, given in some guidelines. Uh, only for reserve cases, for relapses and therapy, uh, treatment failures alone, um, ciprofloxin can be used. Not routinely. The take-home will be, we will not use uh, quinolones. Dr. Shani, one more question for you. Can typhoid conjugate vaccine and flu can be given together? So there are no uh, contraindications to other vaccines uh, to be used on the same day, sir. Only with measles and measles containing vaccines, it should not be given on the same day. Um, Thank you. One more question for you. If typhoid deprivation is by 12th day, then how long you want us to give the antibiotics? Antibiotics, sir. Hmm. And yeah, by think, day 12, uh, the trial told, has uh, shown features of uh, depervescence. Seven days, no? Seven days after depervescence. depervescence. Anyway, it is 14 days, sir. Okay. Only the child has uh, shown features of depervescence later. Thank you, Dr. Balaji. Reason for hyponatremia yes, and streptophys. And uh, uh, all because of uh, endothelial damage and capillary leak, leak. only, sir. Mm. Uh, but uh, the treatment is whenever the per child presents with the fluid overload, it is better to restrict the fluid. So that depends upon the situation about the vascular compartment, whether the child presents with shock or fluid overload, that depends. Then we have to decide accordingly. Most of the time, when the child presents with hyponatremia to fluid overload, it is better to restrict the fluid modestly and manage accordingly, sir. Hyponatremia in any illness in a critically ill child in PIC, which is detrimental. You have to be very careful. Hyponatremia. Yes, sir. There is one difficult question. If dengue and COVID coexist, can steroid be used? Uh, the question is actually. for me. Mm. Actually, Government of India in 2021, actually, they have released on guidelines which uh, actually which answers this question, actually. I went through it, actually. But for lack of uh, time, I didn't put. If dengue and COVID, they coexist, actually, there are, uh, we, we have seen, sir, actually, we have seen cases which coming with both dengue and COVID. They actually, they are different. No, they are classified into three categories, dengue dominant and COVID dominant and both together, you know, co-dominant. And what they say, in the first five days, we should avoid giving steroids. You know, the, I already told you, using steroids in dengue fever, especially during the viremic period, is a death sentence for that patient. Patient will have severe dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome. But after five days, the use of steroids in uh, you know, critical phase, it doesn't give any actually advantage. But if the patient is having a COVID dominant phase, we can use steroids. Sir. That is the Government of India guidelines. We can use steroids after the sixth day. Yes. I, think I agree with you that even in MIC with dengue also same, same uh, rule applies. Yes, okay. yes, sir. yes actually COVID is the MIC also we are having a lot of cases nowadays actually. Sir. Yes. Fluid of choice in strep typhus, Balaji. So, uh, actually, that depends upon the clinical scenario, sir. If the child presents with a shock, better you can go for the crystallites like uh, NS or oral. But uh, whatever you are giving fluid, you have to reassess the child. That is very important. Because all the complications because of the capillary leak and uh, this patient may go for shock or either go for ARDS. So, this both are prone. So, that depends upon the situation you have to decide. So, whenever you are giving fluid, you have to reassess the child. You have to assess the, again ABC and you have to uh, look for the pulses and BP. And then uh, once uh, shock is corrected, we can go for the routine maintenance with uh, our obdiness. Otherwise, if there is shock, you can go correct with the shock with the crystallites like NS or oral. But uh, when in, in, in scrub typers, the shock is not corrected with the fluids. If you start with either dopamine or a noradrenaline, the, the shock is corrected very well and the outcome is also very good. Uh, the uh, inotropes in dengue still controversy is going on, but in scrub typers, it is very much useful, sir. Thank you, Balaji. It's, uh, see, I think I'm very happy about a lot of interaction from the floor. 
So many questions have asked. Really, yeah. I, I wonder, sir. Mm. So many questions they are asking. Oh my God! We were worried that probably floor participation may not be much, but to our surprise and to this very nice, happy to see that he also learned mm -hmm. many things from the participants, mm -hmm. their own experiences. It is shared in the wider platform, and many many of you have suggested nice topics for uh, the future sessions. But uh, what I have decided, I will also discuss with the uh, AAP functionaries and other senior colleagues what we thought we'll take, which is very common seen in seen by a practicing pediatrician, which will be a real problem for them. At the same time, they, they the section should make a change in their way they practice. With this background, we thought we'll choose the topic rather than some rarer diseases. Point can. Can yes, you, yes, can yes, you yes. say, sir? Uh -huh. Sir, uh, one one thing in typhoid fever, we have to drive to all the practicing pediatrician is the dose of cefixime is double of what we use in the regular thing, twenty mg per kg to a maximum of one point two grams, as Dr. Dakshini said, and also the dose of azithromycin is also double, twenty mg per kg to a maximum of one gram per day. Thanks to, uh, that, yeah. This we have to stress to our practicing. Exactly. Patient. Thanks to STD guidelines, even though the 20 milligram per kg, a 10 kg child will reach the maximum dosage. 20 will reach the maximum dose of 400 milligram. So we were in a real confusion whether how much. Nelson gives only 200 BD maximum dose. Thanks to the STD guidelines, a very clear, clear, cleared the confusion, saying that the maximum dose that can be given in the oral dose is 1.2 gram. Is it uh, Daksha, any correct one? You know? Thousand two hundred yes, million maximum doses, so we can we can boldly give that twenty milligram per kg dose. That's Thanks to Dr. Ramesh million. Kumar for the STD guidance, which is very useful for the practitioners to follow, for all of us to follow. Sir, there is one more question for uh, Dr. Yes, Balaji. Dr. Yadini has asked: uh, There are two uh, scrub typhus patients, platelet lower than one lakh. Uh, any other any reason for that? I thought it is thrombocyte opinion, but I wanted from Balaji whether there is any other reason. So actually, in this juncture, uh, there are two things. The patients are not, platelet counts are not improving. If there is no bleed, we need not to bother. But again, we have to rule out pseudo thrombocyte. But the patient is stable, we need not to bother about the counts, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajendran, Dr. Ramesh Babu, uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, um, Selvam, Dr. Suresh Balan, anything? Any comments from your side? Yeah, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Salam, sir. Uh, Salam, sir, we, uh, we had around 35 topics suggested, as you have mentioned. Mm. So probably the senior faculties and the office bearers can uh, decide on the topic, which are going to be uh, very useful for the practicing pediatricians. The session has been made as a wonderful session by the active participation of the delegates and uh, the presence of uh, your Professor Tangavel, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Let this continue for uh, another uh, year and uh, with an active involvement of more and more practicing pediatricians, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, thanks to all the faculties for their uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. One minute, uh, one minute. Uh, Ramesh, please. Dr. Ramesh Babu. Yes, yes. Thanks to all the faculties for their excellent presentation. And thanks to the uh, chairperson, Dr. Selvan sir and uh, Tangavel sir for coordinating it in a very nice way. Uh, even though we have uh, more than around two, uh, two hours and 15 minutes have passed, most of the participants are still present. We will ensure to get uh, credit hours for this thing. And uh, regarding the selection of the topics, uh, we will decide with the seniors as well as uh, other IAP office bearers. And we will finalize for the next month's uh, 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 next month's program. OK, over to Rajendran, sir, for That's very small, thanks. sir. That's very small. Uh, once again, sir, everybody had a very nice uh, presentation, sir. The slides were very good there. Per practical experiences were shared. All the important points well taken. One, my suggestion will be to the editor that uh, these uh, presentations, whatever the important points, no, that can be wrought out in our bulletin, madam. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, sir. Suresh, sir. Suresh, sir. We are planning to, we are planning to 
bring bring out a booklet sir uh, at the end of the year this programs sir every month uh, what uh, hello uh, who is a superstar oru thara pesna no thara kekkara you are telling about uh, culture at the peripheral people sir but in most of the patients already are on antibiotics already are on second generation antibiotics actually actually even after four five days to seven days culture may be possible yeah can yeah. 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 be done sir culture yeah, still till those an antibiotic also because salmonella can be easily cultured it be it will be positive i think we should develop the culture of doing Thank culture you. blood cultures it will be very useful to prove typhoid as well as to identify resistance earlier i think we definitely it may, may not be very expensive maybe it costs around 800000 in chennai maybe even less less or more outside but still i think the seniors should take a decision okay. to organize cultures in their labs in the towns thank you sir i think it's a no complaint and uh, uh, so from uh, uh, rajendra uh, professor sinivasan professor prc any comments janani from any comments dr prc sir prc sir sinivasan sir janani nedinjalian sir elilar sir madam quick comments from you sir it was very good Uh, actually i joined a little late it was excellent and it is really useful learned a lot i mean it was very extens- uh, clear like how to give iv doxycycline what are the problems all that and malaria and of course typhoid and dengue everything was dealt so well so really very happy congratulations to everybody thank you sir uh, dr nedijalin sir dr nedijalin sir nedu okay PRC sir, 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 has given a comment in the chat box, sir. All four invited faculty, Raj, Kumar, Dakshayani, Ekambaram and Balaji, gave very lucid and clear presentation and four important tropical infection and did full justice within the allotted time under the expert guidance of Prof. Tangvelu and Dr. Selman for, uh, from E-Road. Congratulations to IAP DNSC. Great beginning. Best wishes. for the upcoming topics of interest to the practicing pediatricians thank you avi sir but me myself and selvan uh, are not responsible for this only the faculty are responsible thank you so much hello yes, hello yes, as uh, as told by everybody maybe individual disease we can cover it hours together they made it very crisp and nice presentation which was useful they didn't actually miss uh, important points Uh, the appreciation to Dr. Tangvelu sir as well as for the faculty. Keep it up. Sir, without Tangvelu, without Tangvelu, sir, by that this is not a happen, sir. The trial run like uh, was very useful and uh, mainly catering to the like, practicing pediatricians. Otherwise, it would have gone um, astray like that. So, sir was main guidance like uh, to cater to the needs of the topics. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. and. Uh, Uh, really so from uh, next month uh, next month onwards we are having every second sunday 8 to same 8 o'clock we are going to have this meeting and uh, actually we planned uh, initially it's one hour program uh, and if you want to get a credit points we are, at least we need uh, two hours uh, on uh, record purpose we need uh, at least two hours so we will plan accordingly so if we are having two hour program we can have it uh, point by uh, uh, tnsc uh, credit points uh, tnmc we can get it and um, and yes uh, many of the uh, delegates and the faculties uh, suggested we are having lot of topics also interest are there so we will discuss and uh, let you know that within a week and uh, what's the topic next month of uh, topic of interest we plan accordingly and um, i thank really uh, dr tangwell sir it's actually one day call dr tangwell sir and he is readily accepted this concept and uh, and after that we have a discussion with the doctor our uh, president as well as office parents and uh, it's a really a wonderful program and it's a what's a really cut what's a current update for the pedi- practicing a pediatricians and uh, we are really doing very well and uh, next week we are having uh, undergraduates of uh, uh, teaching program that means uh, we have a two days uh, seminar for the undergraduate students for the uh, exam going students we are planning for mbba students uh, almost uh, dr ramachandra mohan has accepted as a program convener 
and uh, we are going going to have this uh, program next uh, Saturday and Sunday. And uh, same same thing. So we have UG and PG teaching program. We are as usual we are conducting. And uh, this month, the end of uh, last Sunday, um, that's a uh, four to six thirty. We are having um, gastroenterology. A CME and uh, program convener is MS Vishwanathan from Apollo Hospital or EB member also. And we are having a lot of uh, uh, program on pipeline. And I thank really our, uh, doctor, our program convener, Dr. Tangwell sir, and Dr. Selvan sir from um, uh, E Road. And today's uh, faculties, uh, Dr. Balaji, Dr. Rajkumar, uh, Dr. Dashaini, and uh, Dr. Agambarnath. So I think. Uh, Past uh, two years, we are having a lot of uh, young faculties. That's a great thing for our IAP. Almost, uh, we are having 200 plus uh, faculties. We have uh, actually we have found out, and they are uh, even national level also. They can be a uh, speakers, and uh, we have implemented in the Puduve um, Padikan also. They are uh, exceptionally very well, and actually they are illustrious. Uh, the Setil Mulita Sindhamari Mari. They are doing really good uh, work. And uh, really happy that uh, IAP TNC have uh, given this opportunity. And almost we are having 200 plus um, uh, uh, speakers and uh, uh, faculties. We can, uh, anytime we can use them for any purpose. And uh, really thankful to our seniors, particularly Dr. Tangavel sir and Dr. SPS and uh, from ICH and uh, uh, all the institutions. They are helped us to bring this. Uh, um, uh, that academic level next to uh, next level. I thank uh, all our uh, office bearers, uh, particularly uh, previous uh, president, uh, Dr. Ismail Sir, Arun Sendil, and uh, currently Dr. Ramesh Babu. They are giving more of importance to our academic and uh, as well as uh, other uh, community uh, uh, pediatric level also. And I thank all the um, uh, delegates today who has attended and seniors who has guided us. And thank you, one and all, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rajendra. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks to Tanguil, sir, and Selvan, sir, for tutoring us so well and making us focus on the subject. Definitely, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Kobal, thank you. Kobal, thank you. Kobal, thank you. Kobal, thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.